Hey everyone, Dennis Chang here. Welcome to another video. I just had this cap made yesterday. It says Gai Kokujin. Gai Kokujin means foreigner in Japanese. So very, very useful cap to have uh, when living in Japan. Okay, today's video is going to be another quick one because I don't have a lot of time these days and I'm forced to make these YouTube videos. Um, anyway, please like, please subscribe if you want to support me, uh, leave a comment, um, you can buy something off of DC Music School, off of Sound Slice. I do have a course, it's kind of related to what I'm going to talk about, it's called the Bebop Vocabulary where I teach you how to construct quote-unquote authentic bebop lines. It's not about scales or arpeggios but about understanding the 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 melodic tendencies of bebop something i'm going to talk about here okay so for this video by the way the lines will be transcribed on sound slice so check the pinned comment for the link um okay what i want to talk about here are these things that i practiced a lot which are super super long lines that on the surface don't seem very practical because rarely do do chords last long enough for you to make full use of the lines but that was never the purpose for me um what what it was instead was to develop some finger muscle memory first of all so that i don't have to think too much but also to develop my ears to hear these melodic tendencies and as i got better and better i was able to take these long lines and turn them into tiny tiny melodic fragments melodic cells that are very much in the style because as I've said in previous videos, a lot of these bebop lines are not necessarily, are rarely based on scale patterns or arpeggio sequences or things like that. It's not like a set formula the way they would teach you a bebop scale, for instance. Because back in the, in the day, I've talked about this in the videos and also on my sound class course, the, the term bebop scale didn't even exist. That's something that came after the fact. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with practicing scales, as I said, I'm not going to repeat myself, but it's just not the way the, the lines are constructed back in the days. If, if they were constructed in any way, it was often based on chords and also chord movement, like the chord progressions. And you'll find all sorts of tiny cells uh, that decorate chord tones and of course you can definitely analyze them in terms of uh, scales or arpeggios but I have a strong feeling that that's not how the musicians themselves themselves were thinking about it they were just thinking about the chord and just having these melodic ideas over them so I, what I want to do in this video is share with you some of the lines that I Practice, still practice today and that I used to practice back in the day very long ones so here's one over a B flat 7 and it's very useful for instance if you're in the key of A flat let's say over Donnelly B flat 7 the, the, the two dominant chords so Donnelly right here or if you're playing um, take the A train the second chord D7 Right, so it's the same function. This one, it works really well over this uh, this function. It, of course, it works elsewhere as well. You can experiment. But here is a long phrase, um, and here it goes. Very nice, huh? So, a lot of this. If you, if you were to analyze in terms of scales, you could probably say that a lot of this is coming from Mixolydian, and it's not incorrect, but it goes beyond just Mixolydian because it's full of these twists and turns and these chromatic uh, enclosures that to simplify it to just Mixolydian is a bit misleading. So the best thing to do is just to practice this line and just get your ears to be accustomed to these uh, melodic fragments. 
and I would practice variations to these. So, and this actually, this is a line that I personally came up with based on multiple fragments, just so that I could have something to play in this position. Here's a vari another variation. Another variation. Another variation. Practice these. Um, I used to spend hours practicing these while watching like <laughs> movies. Um, back in the day, I used to go to. Uh, well, I wasn't really playing so much bebop in those days. I was playing a lot of gypsy. I was doing this with gypsy jazz phrases. Um, I can make a video about that if you want. Leave a comment. <laughs> but yeah. And then when I started getting more and more into bebop, which is actually in recent years, uh, I would practice things like this as well. Uh, the thing about bebop is that I've been listening to that for for almost as long as I have been listening to swing and gypsy jazz. It's just that I didn't really play it. So even though I wasn't really playing it so much, I was listening to it. And so somewhere the vocabulary was already in there when I started like getting really into it. And then as you develop these, this muscle memory and you keep practicing them, somehow eventually your ears will start to hear them. And of course, I didn't practice them mindlessly. I also tried to see how they relate to the chord. So if I did this, I could see this um, upper extension over B flat seven. That means you can play F minor over B flat seven. I explained this in my harmony course and I love how much my guitar is not really in tune and I'm gonna keep it that way because it's beautiful, okay? Oof. So. so this already is really nice. Bebop enclosure. Typical bebop line, but actually it comes from 19th, 1930s jazz. So this is a typical, another typical enclosure over B flat. Uh, the same enclosure. This is something I got from Charlie Parker. He loves this. So, as long as you try to somehow justify it, like relate it to the chord, eventually what will happen is your ears will become accustomed to these sounds. And when you listen to recordings, and which is very, very important, you have to spend a lot of time listening to good musicians that play this kind of vocabulary. Your ears, it's just going to reinforce your ears <clears throat> to the point where you can just start to hear them and then you can break things apart instead of doing this long line. You can just do just that, you know, or 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 maybe just that. So you can reduce them. So you have these very long lines and you can just reduce take the usable chunks in uh, in practice use them in practical situations so i spent quite a lot of time making up my own quote unquote solutions bebop solutions over various chords in different positions and it's still a work in progress so essentially i can never really be in a rut yeah i got some emails recently about people telling me that they're in a rut and it's something that's I just can't understand because I can never ever be in a rut. Um, can talk about that in another video as well. But I'll just look for things where that I feel I'm not so comfortable with, and then I'll just spend some time alone making up long lines. For instance, for instance, here's a fairly recent one over this chord, uh, something like this. Very nice, huh? And then you can just reduce it like something like this. Or or tons of possibilities. Here's another one, C major. 
well also works over A minor. Amazing, amazing. And um, I gotta give credit where credit is due. Um, I learned a lot of this from this guitar player named Clint Strong. He's He's a huge, huge, huge influence on me. Actually, uh, it's a nice story for another time, but he is one of the main influences um, of how I designed DC Music School. He has this uh, instructional video that was released a long, long time ago. And then I stumbled upon, I don't even know how, but like uh, by accident and it's one of the the best videos I've ever seen. You, you should check it out. Clint Strong. And in that video, he shows a lot of these long lines. So I actually absorbed a lot of those lines. I, I think I remember some of them. Like this one over, I think, D minor. I used to practice that a lot. I wasn't playing bebop in those days, but I love that video so much that I, I did take some of those lines and actually never really used them when I was playing gypsy jazz because... It's a different sound. Long lines. You know, in the past few weeks, I was talking about playing fewer notes and nice mel melodies. That's all great. You know, sometimes it's just nice to shred. It was implied, but not directly said, but I want to define these long lines. Like I said, it's these long lines have to be beautiful. It can't be something like, you know, like... That's a long line, but it's boring. I mean, it probably works well for heavy metal shred or whatever. But when I'm talking about long lines, you have... All these combinations of bebop, melodic cells, or whatever style you're playing. And it's not repetitive like these uh, shred patterns, you know. You have twists and turns, you know. Same thing, even if you play like bluegrass guitar. <laughs> so you have to get these melodic tendencies in your ears and in your fingers and often often these melodic tendencies cannot be reduced to simple scale or arpeggio sequence formulas whatever you know things like this all right that's it for today leave a comment please leave a comment please thank you so much bye